All right. Well, welcome everybody to our monthly AAPG PSGD webinar. Uh, today we have Nick Brissett with us, with us, and I'm super excited to introduce him. But before we get started, I just want to just give a quick reminder about our annual field trip. This year, we are actually going to team up with GeoGolf 2024. They have an awesome field trip put on by Sweary, and it's going to be looking at the Laramide Structural Geology near Del Rio, Texas. Um, there's some information here in this flyer. I, I will send another email about this probably next Monday and also post it to our LinkedIn page. So take a look there. I've, I've also sent it previously. Um, but you don't have to be registered for the conference to attend this field trip. So that's good news if you're not able to make both. Um, but you can find more information on the website. And it's going to be led by David Farrell, Kevin Smart, and Adam Kayward. So look at these awesome dudes on that outcrop. <laughs> so be sure to visit the website for the GeoGolf um, geogolf2024.org and then you can click around and find the registration link for all of that. All right, next up, I want to introduce Nick Brissett. Um, he's a good friend of mine, so it's an honor to introduce him and I'm thankful he was able to give this talk today. So Nick is widely experienced in upstream facets, including regional exploration and development geology, both for conventional and unconventional research resource plays. He does prospect evaluation, well site geology, operations, geomechanics, and drilling engineering. So after graduate school, he was immediately hired on with Gun Oil Company in Wichita Falls, where he worked with infamous Wildcatter RD Gun. While at Gun, he worked remote basins such as the Palo Duro, the Tucumcari, the Kerr Basin, the Wittenberg Trough, and the Hardman and Gun Garabins, which is the focus of today's talk. His primary focus was on the eastern shelf in the Valverde Basin north to the Matador Arch, where he managed operational rig programs and generated stratigraphic prospects. Nick worked the Eagleford and Austin Chalk from the Sabinas platform in Mexico to the overpressured regimes in Louisiana, and he generated prospects within the Eagleford by driving the identification and evaluation of targeted acreage acquisitions. He worked as a geological manager in Midland for a private equity, private equity company where he oversaw a five-rig program in the Delaware Basin. He managed the program through mechanical earth models and production evaluations by high-grading lateral reservoir targets by linking reservoir characterization and end cash flows while working closely with the engineering department. So he's pretty well-rounded. Nick earned his bachelor's in geology from DePaul, DePew, DePew University, and a master of science from Ball State. He's a member of AAPG, a certified petroleum geologist through the Division of Professional Affairs. He served as president of the Southwest section of AAPG and on the advisory council. He serves as Oklahoma City Geological Society president and he served as president of the North Texas Geological Society, was on the National Board of AAPG's Continuing Education Committee, and he still serves as an AAPG visiting geoscientist. He belongs to the American Rock Mechanics Association, the American Association of Drilling Engineers, and he's currently a member of the WTGS and OCGS. So with that, Nick, I will let you share your screen and give you the reins. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Oh, and if anybody has questions, feel free to type to type it into the Q and A, and then we'll get to that at the at the end of the talk. All right, all right Nick, it's all yours. Can you see my screen there, Molly? Yeah, it looks good. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to present. This was a, a very unique. Uh, development. When I was at Gun, um, it it, it took decades. I, I hate to say it to get things figured out. Uh, Bob Gun had originally started working this uh, Matador Arch area, continue a continuation up from the King platform, up from the uh, Bateman Faults in uh, King County, and he noticed that there was a uh, a let out and didn't know where it had taken. And uh, 
kind of, I'm going to kind of walk through the presentation of what happened, how we got there, how to manage it. And I'm looking at it from a bunch of different lenses over the time, because when you first start off in your career, you think, great, I get to go out to the rig, I get to see rock, I get to do things, but there are so many little nuances that uh, I just didn't understand at the time because you're still green behind the ears and don't even know how to form questions yet. And uh, it takes time to get things developed. So I'd like to thank AAPG and Molly for getting us all set up. Uh, <clears throat> kind of starting off is uh, a, a case study uh, to the what, to the why, and to the money. And at the time, uh, I think everybody's gusto to get the well down is incredibly important, but it can also exacerbate problems by not understanding what's going on. So if we have cavings coming up over the shale shaker and we're putting them on the floor and we're saying, all right, well, we're in a particular zone, whatever that might be, uh, we just got to deal with it. Well, at the time when you're young, you don't know, you think it's just part of the problem, but how do you mitigate this? And one of my close friends from Midland, he was in uh, Naples, Florida this past week and he sent off a picture of uh, these guys working really hard to burn money. And it's amazing how quickly money can disappear on location, not because of just, not the ability, but just to be, just to say we could get it done. What are we gonna do? And then it, everything's not proactive, but retroactive. So keep this picture in the back of your head throughout this presentation until we get to the end of the presentation. But over time, uh, things were kind of becoming kind of chronic. But the outline of the presentation, I like to do a rock mechanics overview. I think now most people have a good understanding or at least have an understanding of rock mechanics or have seen bits and pieces of certain things. I'm going to kind of walk through the geology of the Matador Arch, the drilling engineering, the geomechanics workflow. And I'm going to use my rock and roll quotes because the rig monster only knows money and how to manage that, and then kind of walk through a series of conclusions. But when we were first drilling these wells, starting in 1989, we were using tricone roller bits. And half the time we would run the, run the cones off, we would run the shanks off. And then before we started applying mechanical earth models, we kind of went at it using PDCs, but then we started missing shoulders and chunks, started breaking off, and the rock is not that hard for this matrix to break on the PDC. So how do we tie these in? And it took a bit, it took, it took, it took time to get things spun up, but once it spun up, it was really cool. So I'm kind of walk through rock mechanics. I'm just gonna kind of breeze through this a little bit. <clears throat> the big thing about rock mechanics is it allows us to reduce drilling costs and duration. If we don't spend the time on the front end understanding rock mechanics, we can still continue to burn money. And that's not what the companies want to do. But there's a couple other things that are involved with rock mechanics. Is one, improves drilling safety and reliability. Don't need blowouts. Don't need other issues. It can reduce your exploration risk and can increase the reservoir performance. Uh, but the biggest thing, the biggest key takeaway is point number five is predicts well bore stability issues, reduces or eliminates stuck pipe, formation collapse, which we saw in the first photo, Lost circulation really didn't have that, uh, but it does happen in other parts of the area. <clears throat> Side tracks, we have done that. Washing and reaming and induced formation fracturing, uh, which we started running FMIs and you can see actually start seeing the uh, TP structures in the uh, drilling induced uh, fractures. And then uh, aids in determining whether over underbalanced drilling is practical or other novel techniques are feasible. And the, to kind of set the stage, we gun uh, had built a rig and it was a triple, but it was a Kelly driven rig to go down to roughly 16,000 foot. And at, remember at the time when we did this, rigs were in the Barnett and elsewhere drilling up all the gas wells. So we couldn't really get a really good rig to, to utilize what we needed in this basin or in the grabbing. And so we built it and we had also used uh, triplex mud pumps that were run by diesel motors. And there's a lot of things that kind of 
we're using 80s technology in in 2007 2008 but we didn't know at the time what we actually needed until we started to un peel back the layers of what was trying to what the rock was actually telling us and what the rig was actually telling us so kind of walking through a couple of quick definitions is we all know what rheology is a study of the flow of matter mechanical earth models and numerical representation of the geomechanical state of the reservoir field or basin of well bore and in this study we're going to be doing a well-centric mechanical earth model which concentrates on the borehole effects such as the breakouts breakdowns collapse sanding issues which we kind of did have well bore stability through near new well near well bore dynamics and simulations we started running high-end advanced logs which allowed us to see things that we normally didn't see in induction we started running Slimmerjay's uh, MSIP tool, uh, along with FMI and the ECS, and we started getting a really good handle on this. And we had not taken any core, uh, whole core. We had taken some rotary sidewall uh, core plugs back in the 90s, but we did not do any destructive properties on those to actually understand Young's modules or Poisson's ratio within them. And by having those sent off the core lab, and then plugged into the model that Slumberger was doing, we were able to kind of get a better handle of what was going on mechanically with the low bore. So we all know what Young's modulus is. It's a coefficient of elasticity of any substance. Uh, for example, a rubber band has a really low Young's modulus, but steel ASTM A36 has a high Young's modulus of 29 million PSI. So it's we're not drilling steel, but the bits are made of steel. So something's going on that's exacerbating the problem. And Poisson's ratio, I call it squat. It's really basically defined as a ratio between lateral strain and longitudinal strain in the direction of stretching force. So how much energy has been absorbed and stored and nothing, the, the ratio's range goes from zero to 0 0.5 and it doesn't go over 0 0.5. And to get an understanding of how stresses work, we're gonna just, Five major types, but in the gravity, we're going to be talking about tectonic stress. And in this example with the C clamp and the H shell, we got an induced stress where we have sigma one, uh, the fracture is created in the max stress direction, and it opens up the aperture. The width that the crack opens up in is in the min stress direction. So at least we have an idea of what's going on. We can use these. It, drilling induced fractures to start indicating max stress direction. We've all seen the stress block diagrams, how things fit locally or even regionally in a uh, principal stress diagram. Vertical stresses are incredibly important. We can use uh, rho B and density to get vertical stress of any particular profile as long as we have the open hole logs for a particular well. But I think one of the, the well bore stability issue uh, models from k &M, once we brought them in to understand what was going on, was most of our wells were drilled at or below pore pressure, uh, which was borehole breakout. And you were still gonna get some partial collapse and washouts, but to get to drill a rifle barrel well bore, we, that wasn't in the cards until 2013. And of course, you want to kind of stay away from the high end drilling induced fractures. It could cause other issues or actually breaking down into the formation. But keep this in mind, too, uh, as we step forward. So I'm going to kind of walk through the geology of uh, the Matador Arch area. Uh, this is from Brister et al. In uh, 2002, they did a wonderful publication on this part of the world. And uh, Cottle County, <clears throat> and uh, the strat column off to the left uh, indicates where our pays basically were in, in the formation across the Matador Arch from possibilities in the lower Cisco Sands, Pelopino Limes, Strong Limes, and of course the major uh, bends, uh, bend group, the upper and the lower bend. But once you got under the Marl Limestone and Chester, we were pretty much out of the section. We started getting glauconite in the Laurel, uh, in the Morrow line, and we knew that we were kind of stepping out. Once then, we kind of got into the fossiliferous lines of the Chester, really palatal, kind of like, okay, it's we're, we've gone through the full bend section. We know there's no pay lower, so that we needed to have markers on our log. So that's what we tried to get was through the Chester. Sometimes the Chester wasn't there, we'd go straight into the, the chapel. We never went down to the Ellenberger. 
But our wellbore stability issues basically started right out from underneath the surface casing <clears throat> at about a thousand foot to our 16,000 foot TVD interval. And we, it just continued and the, the gusto to keep going uh, was there, but we had run into major issues. So the location here, the wonderful USGS geologic map that came out, oh, I'd say 15, 16 years ago. Uh, here we are in Cottle County. Here's the uh, Paducah, Texas. I spent a lot of it, a lot of time there, and then the gun ground is kind of in the southeast corner of the of the uh, county. Once again, back to uh, Brian's paper. This was a, a really good paper for kind of pulling in the geology of how this all kind of fit together tectonically. Is here's the uh, Fort Worth base and the Knox Baylor trough, uh, the King platform, and then right here is where the, uh, the gun grab is at in between two pop up structures, which are horse, and they actually have canyon and some uh, Cambrian production along here. But the all these pop ups are good reservoirs and have been produced since the 40s and 50s. And then there's a splay off from the Red River uplift into the Wichita uplift. And then you got the Anadarko and Apelladura Basin. So we kind of have a geologic structural setting of how this kind of all fits together. Zooming in on this, we can see that the Matador Arch Tectonic System has a series of horse and grobbins. From east to west, we got a grobbin. And then we get into kind of a horse structure. Then we get into the in situ kitchen here uh, where Bob had, where Gun Oil had drilled the, the first well in 1989, taking it deeper, trying to understand the, the not only tectonics, but all, all the deposition of the bend section through and into this common aiding space here in uh, southeast central uh, Cottle County. Off to the west, we get another horse, then we fall off into another grobbin. And it's just alternating back and forth, a series of horse and grobbins. And the, uh, like as, as I mentioned, the gro this grobbin is the only one that's deep enough to get into uh, uh, the in situ kitchen where it actually cooked and developed oil, <clears throat> but mostly it had developed gas and extending out from the grobbin as we have a series of gas fields that step back up uh, southward into, the, uh, into King County. And then you have the, the master Bateman fault that comes right through here, which is it, which I believe is the northern extent of the Fort Chadburn fault system, which starts off in Val Verde uh, County or Val, yeah, basically Val Verde Basin up north. And it runs parallel with the Bend Arch continuing up to the Matador Arch. <clears throat> Stepping across where the major gas play is here, here's kind of an index map. We have an east to west map with a cross section walking through, and this is uh, actually ground level. It's, it's a structural cross section, and the Smithwick Shale is the top of the bed section. It's a maximum flooding surface. So uh, as we step into the base, we can actually see the, the actual drop. And even if you hang it stratigraphically on the Pelopino, which is one of our major markers, you can actually still see the structural component at stratigraphic uh, flattening. So it's really unique to see this. So roughly we're at 13,000 foot TVD and uh, this is sits on top of a east-west running positive flower structure that is northeast of the asymmetric grobbin that let out that we did not actually truly drill into. But the fields well off to the southwest was a vertical test drilled back in the 90s, and uh, we had continuous gas to surface as um, they drilled down to TD. It was unstratified, had a gas buster out there, had some just roaring gas as we were drilling, went to go complete it, and had nothing but a whimper. And what had happened, I believe, is since it's unstratified, we've got into an unconventional place in the, the basin where we actually need to start going lateral to contact more of the reservoir properties that are in the relaxed stress setting of the, uh, the grobbin itself. So kind of placing this in perspective is we have a left lateral strike slip setting. We have our asymmetric, well, actually this is our plunging uh, basin access westward. Uh, here's the major positive flower structure. You can actually kind of see it extend out. This is on Pelopino uh, time. And we can see the compartmentalization of each of these faults as it steps baseward into 
the deep part of the basin. Unfortunately, these faults have so much throw on them that in software kind of blocks some of the uh, geology at depth and the colors. But the next slide here, <coughs> excuse me, gives us an idea of how the uh, graben is set up. So Burnett drilled these wells in the 90s and in 2000s, early 2000s, and they didn't encounter as much drilling issue as Gunn did. But as we step down into this, what appears to be not a valley, but we start dipping relatively fast across the Gunn property into the graben. So basically, if this is Pelopino here, say it's roughly 7,000 foot TBD. Down here, we're getting close to 10,000, maybe 11,000 foot TBD. So even though it's continuous, this is our last event on our mapped horizon that we can actually see before everything falls apart inside me. Kind of walking through here, east to west, kind of, uh, it's an arbitrary line. We can see where the sand patches develop. This is the Pelopino um, top right through here. It's kind of jumps around because we have faulting and different blocks kind of set up different uh, tops. The purple is the pre-bend, uh, approximate pre-bend. But then I have proposed a deep well to drill the actual base and axis of deep part. And that roughly put us at three seconds on seismic. I'm sure we're going to get into meta sediments at depth, but the biggest issue was we, in order to drill a deep well, there's it, we had to understand how to drill these wells first, back up on the power on the up on the uh, flower structure. Everybody likes seismic, so here's a 14 mile east west uh, seismic line. Uh, here is the Pelopino going down into uh, the uh, the basin. Here's the pre bend. We lose it. We know that we have pre bend down here. We just don't do this. Multiple master faults come through here. We can see the, the drop in the graben. And most of the picking was done east-west because when we step north-south, we get a ton of rain because of the, the, the tightness of the basin itself. So the seismic, as we when Bob drilled the well in 89, we had, they had drilling issues then. It walked up dip due to the dipping beds. But we didn't know that it had stepped into this graben. And they shot seismic to understand it and realize, oh, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we have at least five different 3D shoots here that were all reprocessed to understand what's going on here. And we can see how the divots in the seismic exist. So basically what happened is we did get wide enough to see the actual bottom part of the graben and creating velocity models for this was incredibly difficult because you can do it in one part of the graben up in a flower structure, we had good data, but trying to apply it at depth became a real booger. Uh, here is uh, a north-south line across the positive flower structure here where Burnett and kind of like where Gunn's properties are or were. You can see the rollover of the pal pinnel coming down and then you see the, the, the positive uh, structure of the flower dips back down and then builds back up to the north. So there's a series of faults that are kind of running uh, strike slip, creating the, uh, the pop-up for this uh, really good bend producer section. Kind of getting another idea of how this all fits together with all the other uh, uh, displays is, this is the Palopino structure, and we can, this is outlined in red, we can see how it lets out. Here's the pre-bend section, and it just screams down to uh, basement, supposedly, we don't know. And the next map here shows our master faults, but the field's fault roughly from the Cambrian production up here that Bass had discovered down to the pre-bend structure is roughly 7,500 feet straight down. So it's basically a gigantic wall where everything is just smeared uh, to, to create the asymmetry, asymmetry of the graben. Really complex stuff, but really, really cool. So... Stepping into, that was kind of the geology response, but how do we actually drill this? We knew that we had charged sands. The gases were rich. They would come on, you know, high BTU gas, uh, deliverabilities on some of these. When we first went to go clean them, to complete them, were between two and three million. 
By the time we started applying rock mechanics, we actually started getting up to four, four and a half million a day. So it, it was a really good application of how to take the next step and utilize technology. Uh, to understand what was going on uh, prior to 2013, what would happen is we would drill until we kind of lost control of the rig. The, the buoyed weight of the BHA and the string got so heavy that it started just driving itself. But we started backing off weight, thinking that we were actually cutting good hole, but in reality, we weren't. We were actually drilling low angle tangents. And uh, the next demonstration of what happened, I'll kind of walk through that quickly. But what happened is that as we have this deviated well bore, we started getting into severe swab and sort surge effects. And as we would wash back down, we were actually hydraulically hammering the formation at the same time, thinking we're cleaning it, but we're actually inducing higher pressures and breaking down into the formation. And when we go to trip, it would fall, collapse back in. So it was a series of problems that we didn't quite have a handle on until we started applying geomechanics. Uh, one of the key things uh, we need to note is temperatures were kind of cool. They're still 170 degrees, but old thought philosophy was bring the uh, viscosity up over 80 plus to sweep the hole clean, which we did, keep the water loss low, spot oil as needed. But when we went to go open hole log, we actually, it looked like you had desecration, des desiccation cracks on the mud because it was so dry and dehydrated and hot that it was actually a loose paste. And that wasn't what we really needed. So the old school muscle drill approach was handled up to a certain point until it just started taking more money to get fixed. We could get it down, but did we have a workable well bore? And the key thing, key takeaway is we were drilling vertical wells, but they were actually low angle tangents. And here's the, the first train wreck well that we had. It was the Brothers 8. The max inclination got out to 25 degrees, took 60 days to drill. And the, uh, the had multiple dog legs. We had 18 round trips, numerous short trips, washes and rings, and then re-drilling the well again. Uh, so we had a pigtail well bore. And then when we went to go run the uh, the long string the long string production uh, P110, it was of course you know the best pipe you could get. But at the same time, we actually buckled the pipe trying to get it down to get it cemented to get it completed and 30 days uh, to complete completion after TD economics kind of already shown that this well most most likely even if, even though we got it to produce will never pay out because of the upfront cost to get this uh, well down uh, was probably never reached so it's just one well but there's multiple wells in there so the clues are always telling you. You got splintered shales coming up uh, in the in the samples. Like, oh, this is great. You know, we're breaking. You know, we got we got the formations coming in at us. What what are we doing about it? Oh, we're just going to throw mud weight at, it. or th you know, increase the mud weight, which is good, but we're going to increase it with bar or uh, gel that night to sweep it out. But we're still having the same problems. So drilling practices had to change too. And of course, we had uh, the well bore stability issue with all the cavings. We saw this picture earlier. And then down whole question, we started asking, why are we always failing to reach targeted TD? Why does deviation happen? We knew it was dips, but there's also other issues managing there. Uh, are we actually managing the well bore? Vaulting, dipping beds, sediment compaction, pore pressures were not understood. Stresses were discussed, but they weren't... Uh, we didn't know about them. We we're like, okay, we're just drilling this, but there's still residual stresses there going on. But the other key thing was the rig was actually vibrating and we had mechanical failures that we didn't, we weren't documenting correctly. And then we always had continual MPT trips, washing and reaming and redrilling. How has payout affected the drilling project? The project had been shut down three times prior to 2013, not because of drilling, but because the strip prices were so uh, whipsaw. Once we got up to thirteen dollars in early, you know, two thousand five, two thousand six, get the rig out there because now we can make money. Once it was cut in half, down to three or four dollars, or even lower, it's like we got to get rid of the rig. The project was shut down, so it was 
always this continual uh, back and forth. And then I know we had cost overruns on the AFEs, economic runs, and the pipe contract or the pipeline contracts with Enbridge were uh, a sticker too. So the question is, how can we continue to drill and have drilling issues in shallow 12,000 foot TV deal wells and expect to drill a deep test in the kitchen? Uh, like I said, here's the Tief well, which is German for deep, was 21,000 TV deep. It's just, just an idea. Uh, is it possible to increase P rate rock, manage the well board at the same time and stay on bottom longer to shave off drilling days? And yes, you can, but it overcome previous, we had overcome previous drilling practices. And then how many unknown net safe peg sands were not cut because we did not reach the target of TD? So in 2007, Gunn had drilled the Martin 3-1 well, which is on the western edge, kind of close to the gravel, but there's the, the field's fault and a handful of faults that kind of come together in this corner. And we wanted to extend the field. There was Ben Sands, but we had a real challenge drilling as well. So we got in touch with Slumberjay because at the time we were like saying we, we, they had the better tools. They had Power V, and I'm not, I'm not saying that was the best or whatever it is, but Slumberjay had the tools to get what we wanted to do. The biggest booger was as we were drilling new wells, uh, this was a uh, push the bit system. So you had to have a pad, you had to have well bore to, to push the bit to where it needed to go. It also needed high flow rates from the, uh, the, the mud system, but we couldn't deliver it. If we did deliver it because we had the diesel engines, we didn't know this at the time, they would send a harmonic down the drill string through the mud system where it would interfere with Slumber Day's drilling manager or engineer to communicate with a bit. Because the, the gallons per minute were so high, once we backed it off, we could talk to the bit again or the BHA. So there was a lot of different things that were going on at the same time. And the well had produced, but it was just not a good well. And then at that time, Slumberjay was, they knew that their tools would work because they had drilled other deep basins globally. And one of my close associates, Ireless Brooks, uh, he said, to take the next step, we need to do the open hole logs to understand what's going on downhole. So it, we, we walked through the advanced logging suites and then it was just, it was baby steps at first to get things rolling, but we needed of course, your standard uh, triple combo. We needed to run a true uh, high anisotropy uh, sonic, sonic scanner and then throw the basic of the kitchen sink at this well to understand what's going on. So kind of the workflow of the rock mechanics, I'm not going to walk through this too heavily, but we're going to get through this. Um, we have to go through this petrophysics, the surveys, uh, the mud logs, and build all this into the model. Then we have to take our triaxial compressive stress from the rock mechanics of our sidewall cores and then back that into the model, at least get an idea of what's kind of going on. And then to understand the type log, remember these are 30 degree dipping beds at any workplace on average. So if we had a 58 thick channel sand, it's not really 58 foot thick. It's because we're having dip and we're cutting through a bigger section of it isopactically. So these sands could be anywhere between five to 20 foot thick, but because we're in the interval longer, we had better sands exposed, but we still weren't uh, truly managing the way we need to, to, to get the completions and the drilling mechanics down. Uh, faulting and bedding, we had faults that we had not seen in seismic, but we're getting fault drags up to 60 degrees. Bedding planes in, in uh, the Brothers 821 were 55 degrees. So there was a lot going on with these beds dipping into the, into the gravel that we needed to understand in order to execute better drilling practices and completions. We, of course, had natural fractures. We had borehole enlargement, which means we were underbalanced. And then we got into our TP structures of drilling-induced fractures. And I believe this well was a Rochelle well or the Kegler well, where we could actually start saying, okay, well, this is starting to break out in the breakdown in the east-west direction. Now we kind of get an orientation of how these wells are, how they're being completed. Instead of assuming that, oh, we're just completing near well bore, how far are these wings or wing or whatever is going 
how far is it extending it out from the well bore? Kind of, and then of course the the we got into the high anisotropy. We weren't going to complete that. We completed in the isotropic zone. We had a lower boundary, so we know we had good packages. We had good isolation. We just need to really hit the hammer on these zones through the uh, through the study of uh, the sonic scanner uh, uh, sonic array. The the mechanical earth model on a three one. Uh, really started to indicate that we drilled the well under balance. We were only at about a nine pound mud. We needed it to be at 11. Here's uh, the barrier breakdown to break out. Most of the time we had washed uh, the well bore in. So we went from drilling a seven, seven eighths bit to 10 to 11 to 15 inches to whatever, however big it needed. In fact, sometimes the caliper got so wide, we didn't even know how big the, the, the borehole breakout was. We had to back in vertical stresses, so we had an overburden gradient of 1.05 PSI per foot. This is calculated from the density logs, and it increases with depth. Uh, poor pressures, uh, based off of the, the rotary sidewall cores and everything else going on, we had to back in the, uh, the poor pressures to create the, the nice path, to this, uh, the poor pressure gradient, so we had a handle of what's going on. We then started backing in the elastic moduli to be able to get the compression, all of the shear and compression from the sonic scanner and the velocities, density, and alpha. Uh, there was, remember, there's no core correlation. We had started backing in the rock strength, the unconfined rock strength, uh, and the tensile strengths. And then uh, being able to say that, okay, something's going on as soon as we get out of the strong section where something's going on drastically where we have erratic rock strength values. And then we started realizing that the horizontal stresses above the cattle bend were isotropic, below were anisotropic, and they broke out in every which direction. We actually started using the instantaneous shut-in pressure from our previous completions to start building in the model better. We started to realize that uh, the predominant stress states in, a, in our tectonic setting were varied. We went to a, from a compressed to a relaxed system. Uh, we know that as we stepped into the graben itself, but we didn't have a, the, the well there to confirm it, we were get stepping into a true relaxed state where the HMAX equaled the actual uh, horizontal min stress. We then could actually sample the mechanical stratigraphy across the whole of and to say, okay, what's the Pelopino indicating? What are the sands indicating? And we can actually start breaking it out and highlighting specific uh, specifics across the area to get what we needed to. And then once we started getting a composite of all this put together, we can actually start creating a well bore uh, drill map of where we needed to be for pound per gallon across a specific zone. So we can actually start managing the, the mud system a lot better. And then here is our borehole breakout direction on the uh, Kegler, the Rochelle, the Martin 3, 1, and the Brothers. So everything's kind of due east-west as indicated by the strike slip orientation of the Graben itself and the big, greater regional structure. Sorry I'm going fast, but I got a couple more slides I got to cover that are important, and I'm running out of time. So the rig monster only understands money. You can use your cookie monster voice, whatever you want, but it does. It doesn't care if it's out there for a year or 10 days or a thousand years. It only takes money. And the days that we did not get underneath our average was money. So we can see how all the wells, uh, uh, the broken bone rock chart, some wells went better than others, others were bad. In terms of drilling, how do we manage that? And what geomechanics and rocket mechanics allowed us to do is we can actually start coupling all this together and start to create the drill map that we needed over time because we had all the offset logs. How do we start sampling into where we need to be or what can we expect that's coming up? And we can actually take all the PASON data or the NOV data, whatever it was for the rig measurements, and start typing it and saying, here's the issues. So it was a, a very much a dynamic uh, uh, setup. Prior to 2008, the, uh, the rock charts were pretty basic and there was no need to do anything other than that, say, okay, well, we're below the average or above the average. 
that masked a lot of details in the, the rig because we can hide time built into the rig based off of trips or whatever was needed at that particular time. So we needed to start really breaking out the details of utilizing our formation tops based off of our drilling days and how many trips, whether we're cementing, washing and reaming, whatever it was to really start building out a forensic case of what these formations are doing. So that way we can actually relay that information back to the rig. And in this particular well, we went from 13 bits to, to get down to TD. So how did we manage this and walk through? In fact, part of the data was misleading because we would send off our information to Smith. They come back with that drill bit optimization uh, system, the DBOSS, which was great. They could start telling us what we needed, but we weren't actually utilizing it correctly because it was, okay, we're going to run a tricone bit, but we weren't actually backing in the full GM mechanics. So now we can actually start placing the correct bit in because of GM mechanics. Our completions mechanics were pancake and cigar shaped, and the, the wings started going off. The actual horizontal stresses at depth in the graben were greater than the vertical stress. So they were actually flying out away from the well bore. They weren't growing up, they were going out, so they were creating wings. But bedding dips affected completions too. So much was going on. Were they going up dip? More likely they were, but how far? We don't know. How far down dip were they going from the well bore? That was the modeling that we needed to still do in the completions attempts. So in conclusion, we have a mem well on the left and a non-mem well on the right. To say that we needed a mud up, we had multiple washouts in a non-mem well, and this is a hundred foot interval. So we wanted to reduce the washouts. We had 11 washouts in the non-mem well. We had six. We still had washouts, but this is still an understanding. We were trying to understand how this was going and how to manage it. <clears throat> I'm not saying that mechanical earth models are going to reduce everything to, to, to uh, an exact point, but it allowed us to understand what the problems were. Once we started doing this, we can actually start planning our trajectories with gyro data or whoever we're using down hole to say, okay, here's our bit service. How far do we want to walk? We, we had a 200 foot target radius of where we wanted to be. We could kind of see from surface where the well bore had actually walked. We can actually start predicting where we wanted to be. And then this kind of walking through before a non mem well, uh, we had multiple deviations through the majors. One at depth got up to 18 degrees at TD. Once we started, uh, kind of coupling all this together, we can still see how we didn't do the Kegler well, which is the South, uh, still didn't have the mechanical earth model, but we still started walk, walking a, a, a bit. Eight degrees was still not bad, but eight degrees after eight degrees after each, it starts building upon itself. And so from TBD to dropping a penny at, from the Derrick down to straight down didn't happen, it kind of rolled. The next well, when we started applying it, was the Ro Rochelle well, which is an offset to the Kegler. We managed it a little bit better, but then we lost control because we were on the western edge of another positive flower structure is actually running north-south, which is kind of mind-blowing at the time, but it started walking in a different direction than what everything else did. So we still built angle, but then once we actually had total application of the uh, mechanical earth models, we can actually stay under one degree. In fact, it was really kind of remarkable when we actually had these. It's like, how do we, how do we get this? How do we get to this point? And all of a sudden we're under 0.2 degrees for the entire well bore. And it's because we started managing it. It's when Drilling practices started to step up. We can actually get better completions. Now we can actually control the well. So the, the Majors A4, the Brothers A21, uh, the uh, Russell 10, I believe, they all started to really become rifle barrel. So in conclusion, continuing our conclusion, geomechanics is a linchpin for understanding well bore stability. It allows us to provide straighter rifle barrel TBD wells. Uh, we can understand rock properties through rock mechanics. We actually have a workable vertical well bore and highly faulted fractured and high angle dipping beds. 
poor pressure, poor, this is another key takeaway, poor pressures and principal stresses can't be controlled, but they must be recognized and modeled, which drives ECD, ESD, mud weights, rheology, and everything else. Listening and watching the entire well bore is drilling practices. So sample cutting provide the clues of what's occurring down hole, the rig mechanically through shocks and vibrations, which, which is a completely another study for mechanical specific energy, and the forensic documentation of MP studies because it actually is money. So drilling days can be cut and round trip times were cut. We save an average of four hours on round trips because we didn't have to wash and rain. I would say we average at or above 40 plus days down from 50 plus days. The initial goal was to get down to 30 days, which we could, but the uh, fall in oil prices in 2014 uh, cratered the whole, the whole deal. afford not to spend the money on the science to understand what's going on. And I know that we want to start making cuts, but we, we shouldn't uh, have to uh, create additional issues by that. So the, the object is to be proactive, not retroactive and utilize experience and knowledge to understand what is happening. However, don't let it cripple decision-making because all bases are the same. And I'm not saying this company or any other company, but old drilling practices die hard. Once the science comes out and how to do things, it becomes very, um, you have to, it, there's a human element of being able to speak to everybody of how to get everybody on board to, to move in the same direction. So observation and additional study and spinoffs from this uh, uh, great project was, of course, we have to continue geological structural stratigraphic studies. There's completions engineering studies that need to, to still continue. The reservoir engineering of each one of those sand packages, in geophysics, extend the 3D shoot, and of course, petrophysical of being able to back in HRA facies and sand body identification, more MEMS, rock mechanics, but all this all coupled in helps drive the contracts of a specific, uh, whether you get the right rig, you can create the drill maps, you can start designing your bits, you can start designing your BHAs, you can start planning laterals, you can start map modeling your mud a lot better. And then pipeline contracts of creating the deliverability of saying, we can go from 20 million to 30 million to 60 million, whatever it is, here's where it's at. So forward modeling on Cash flow is incredibly important. And geomechanics provides a link for all oil and gas disciplines and can be applied to any basin, shelf, or graben, or any unknown geologic setting. So I'd like to thank all the people that were involved, including Bob and Ireless, Megan, Bill Stevens, Greg Norman, Brian Brister, all my friends and associates. I without you, this project doesn't move and it doesn't, it's not one person, it's a group of people of each specific person being able to communicate to bring everything back to the table to make a project ultimately work. The references I'd like to leave you with are, um, with this, I would highly recommend Brian Brister's paper to understand what's going on, but uh, to reach out to Slumber J, uh, Robert Skopek has some great work and so does Lawrence Teufel and Zobak. So utilizing those studies really helped to highlight what's going on. So in that, thank you very much. Sorry, I kind of flew through this and it's all kind of high level, but there was a lot to, to cover and there's still much more to do on this. And with that, thank you. Awesome, great work. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good timing too. That was a lot to cover and you did it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, there were two questions that came in. Would you like me to read those to you or would sure. you read them yourself? Okay. So the first one is from Doug Tupperwine. Has anyone tried using oil-based mud? Yeah, we had discussed using oil-based muds, but it was the cost of getting rid of the cuttings and disposal of them. Uh, we were actually using water-based muds and kind of went to a polymer system in its own way. Uh, we did not use and utilize the mud system. That was another huge cost because I remember those mud bills are getting up to $120,000, $150,000. We, 
we would dump it because it was the the mud system was over here. Uh, but we needed what we needed to do is start reusing that mud for spud mud to to reduce costs and to keep it hydrated. The whole time would have been difficult due to the the time. But no, we did not have a oil based mud system that would have helped. But that's a high end cost where we knew that we could have actually modeled since we did model the rheology. K and M never. Um, uh, su suggested we need to go to oil-based because they knew that they could handle it through the water-based mud system. Awesome. Um, there's uh, two questions by Raul Varela. You kind of answered this already, but I don't know if you have anything else to say. He asked if you were drilling with water-based mud, but made a comment about the effect on shales and like the shale reaction to water. Yeah, the the shells did not really react. And that was kind of the, the one thing that was kind of from the eastern shelf is that we thought that by having the, the water loss controlled in the, the mud system that the water would somehow disperse in the mud system. But the, the, the shales were so tight and so hard to break that the water would not even uh, absorb into the, the shales themselves, creating issues. It was this was a pure stress and tectonic issue we had to manage. Okay, okay. Um, and then second part of that question, what about MSE relationship with geomechanic parameters like UCS or friction angle? They, that's another great question. That's a whole nother study. Uh, the mechanical specific energy, remember this is a Kelly driven rig and not a top drive driven rig. We had to put a rubber donut on the bottom of the Kelly underneath the sub to measure the actual torque, but once we were able to get the mechanical energy into and starting studying, we can actually break that out and say, here's what it's gonna take to cut this rock. And then once we got the, the rock tight, we can then back in the actual compressive strengths from the shale plugs to start creating a, a mechanical stratigraphy portion of what the graba needed in order to figure out how we needed to, to drill this correctly. And that's that that was one of the studies that had started, but it kind of had uh, lost its way after 2014 and the uh, the price drop. Awesome, awesome. Uh, the next one is just a comment from an anonymous attendee. It said, it "Would be like nice to use Molly's cube in the slides for stress regime." So I'll I'll make sure you get a few of those. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um. Any other questions from the audience, feel free to type it in the Q&A uh, or, or the chat, whatever's easier. I can also unmute you, I think, if you raise your hand, if that helps. Um, was there any core at all in this, Graben? I know you mentioned there was no core. No, there was no vertical hole core. That that was one of the things we needed to, to do, but we couldn't even drill the well. So it's kind of hard to put down a core barrel and stick a core barrel when we were planning uh, BHAs. Yeah. So in a thousand years when we need steel, this would be a good place to go back because it's all buried down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm I'm just curious from like a stratigraphy perspective and like the tectonic stratigraphy, was that was it underwater? Would it be like deep water or would have those been like alluvial sediments? I'm just just curious with from a tectonic Pennsylvania tectonic, tectonic. from a tectonic point point is you had the graben letting out and you had the shoreline somewhere in and around that area, Molly. So you'd have these channels and the Ouachita's were feeding that and those conglomerates coming in. So as the sea regressed, it would pull those channels. That's why we have channel deposition. So I think the graben is nothing more than a big mixing pot of everything. And that's why the fields well up to the Southwest was unstratified. And everything back up to the north was sand shale, sand shale, sand shale, sand shale, but it was feeding into the graben. And those conglomerates actually continued across the graben and into the south, into the kind of the northern part of the Knox Baylor trough. So you have the bend sections. So that those bend sands were still continuing across the graben, but they're filling up in the graben first. So you had the, the pulsing shoreline changing. So you always had this continual. Uh, dumping of the sand so if they're dumping up in oklahoma they then when the sea regressed it all come dumping down in the graben so the graben would fill up cool cool yeah definitely some exciting tectonics for sure um i didn't see any other questions come in so 
with that, I would like to thank you, Nick, for giving this awesome talk today. I will get this uploaded to YouTube within the next week and post that to our LinkedIn page. And just want to say thank you again. Well, thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Have a great day. Yeah, see you later. Take Bye. care.